The following presentation has been produced by Electrolysis Research Corporation, located in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Electrolysis Research Corporation is dedicated to the advancement of electrolysis as a profession through basic research and the production of educational materials. This topic will be discussed by Dr. James Schuster, a well-known lecturer in the field of electrolysis. Dr. Schuster's credentials include training in electrical engineering and medicine at the University of Wisconsin and dermatology at the University of Michigan. Dr. Schuster is a board certified dermatologist and licensed electrologist practicing in the state of Wisconsin. We are indeed pleased to present this unique educational opportunity. Our topic is galvanic electrolysis, a modality that has withstood the test of time and today is widely used for both straight galvanic and blend epilation. In our order of presentation, we will first look at the history of electrolysis, going back to 1869 when Charles Michel began his first experiments with electrolysis for permanent hair removal. We will then look at the basic concepts of direct current and how it produces the electrolytic effect. After basic concepts, we will analyze the variables that are important to the electrologist and consider their effect on the pattern of lye production. A dramatic part of this presentation will be observing the actual destruction of fresh human hair follicles by electrolysis using microscopic video techniques. We will then discuss several important considerations like current paths in the body. And finally, we will conclude with a statement of the overall relevance of galvanic electrolysis and its future for permanent hair removal. As most electrologists well know, the field of electrolysis is full of ambiguous terms. We agree that the term electrolysis should remain as the generic term for the profession in general. We are electrologists. We practice electrolysis. The term electrolysis, however, is also loosely used to indicate both galvanic and shortwave forms of permanent hair removal. In an attempt to prevent confusion, we refer to the different modalities as galvanic electrolysis, thermolysis, and blend electrolysis. Other terms that you might encounter for galvanic electrolysis include just plain electrolysis, galvanic, direct current electrolysis, and in this lecture we will use galvanic electrolysis. The history of electrolysis began with the research of Dr. Charles Michel an ophthalmologist from St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Michel was perplexed by the problem of ingrowing eyelashes. These bristly hairs could rub on the cornea of the eye, sometimes leading to blindness. Plucking these erupting eyelashes was not easily accomplished by the afflicted person, and other methods of the time were either too destructive or ineffective. To find a safe, effective method for treating this common cause of blindness, Dr. Michel began research in 1869. His first apparatus used a simple battery and a small wire filament which he inserted into the eyelash follicle. The results were astounding. No more hair, plus the method was safe and permanent. Dr. Michel first published his findings in 1875 in the St. Louis Clinical Record. Additional research followed quickly and the method was readily accepted by the medical community. It was also not surprising that the technique was soon used for treatment of hypotrichosis. And after a number of years, trained technicians called electrologists began using the technique. As time went by, the slowness of single needle electrolysis became apparent. In 1916, Professor Paul Cree devised an electrolysis machine that used more than one needle. The method was subsequently called multiple needle electrolysis and has been used successfully up to the present time with only minor modifications to provide more ease of use. Other pioneers in the development of electrolysis were Henry St. Pierre and Arthur Hinkle who were responsible for combining galvanic and short wave currents to produce what has been called the blend technique. 
This modality caught on slowly, but currently enjoys great popularity throughout the United States and abroad. The theory upon which galvanic electrolysis is based on is that the effect of direct current on a salt solution. It has been known for a long time that the flow of direct current through a solution of salt water produces a unique reaction. The electrical current causes the salt and water to break down into their constituent chemicals, which then rearrange themselves to form entirely different chemical substances. This process of direct electrical current working on a salt solution is called electrolysis. In this diagram, we show exactly what happens during the electrolysis of saline. For those of you wondering what saline is, a simple definition is salt water. If you take a tablespoon of table salt and dissolve it in a quart of water, you have saline. During electrolysis, whether in the human body or in the laboratory, the same chemical reactions occur. Sodium chloride, which is table salt and water, change to sodium hydroxide, which is lye, and hydrogen gas at the negative electrode, and hydrochloric acid and chlorine gas at the positive electrode. Of course, if you want this reaction to occur, you need a constant flow of direct current passing through the salt solution from negative to positive. Here we have a simple drawing illustrating electrolysis. First of all, we have direct current flowing in a complete circuit from the current source, which can be a simple battery, to the negative electrode, then through the salt solution to the positive electrode, and then back to the current source. If we look at the negative electrode, we see tiny bubbles forming around it, which are hydrogen gas. These rise to the surface. In the solution around the negative electrode, sodium hydroxide or lye is formed. It's the caustic nature of lye that destroys tissue when this reaction occurs in the human body. At the positive electrode, we also see tiny bubbles forming, which represent chlorine gas and possibly some oxygen gas. In the solution surrounding the positive electrode, hydrochloric acid is formed. It is this combination of chlorine gas and hydrochloric acid that can irritate the skin causing indifferent electrode rash. A special concept that all electrologists should understand results from the application of Faraday's law. Simply put, this law states that the amount of lye produced in a follicle is directly proportional to the amount of current flowing in milliamps and the time in seconds that the current flows. An example shows that the same amount of lye is produced with different variations of current and timing. The exact same amount of lye is produced if you adjust your machine to one milliamp and depress the pedal for five seconds or set it for a tenth milliamp and depress it for 50 seconds or set it for five milliampers and depress it for one second. Faraday's law is what the familiar units of lie is based on. Arthur Hinkle was the first to use this term, and it remains as the basis for epilator settings, depending on the type of hair being treated. One unit of lie is defined as the amount of lie produced when direct current of one-tenth milliamp flows for one second. Following from this basic equation, five units of lie will be produced if five-tenths of a milliampere flows for one second, or if one-tenth milliampere flows for five seconds. Faraday's law on units of lie is probably the most important concept in understanding galvanic and blend electrolysis. Let's consider the basic circuit of a galvanic epilator. This diagram shows the simple components that are necessary. The most important component is a source of direct current. 
early galvanic epilators used batteries. A common six volt battery works just fine. Modern galvanic epilators take household alternating current and change it to direct current using a rectifier. The direct electric current then flows from the negative pole of our DC source through a milliammeter to the electrolysis probe. The milliammeter is necessary to tell us how much current is flowing in the circuit and considering time how much lie is being produced. From the probe the electric current flows through the tissues of the body to the indifferent electrode which is usually held in one hand. From the handheld electrode, the current flows back to the positive pole of the DC source. In order to turn the current on and off, a switch is placed in the circuit. A rheostat or variable resistor is also used to vary the intensity of the current. As you can see, the galvanic epilator circuit is quite simple. Some electrologists wonder why the indifferent electrode is necessary with galvanic and not with thermolysis. The reason is high frequency current can flow through the air by capacitive return. Direct current doesn't have this capability so a wire is necessary to complete the circuit. Let's briefly look at our circuit. Uh, we see our DC source with a negative pole and a positive pole. Uh, the current travels in this direction uh, through the milliammeter which tells us how many milliamps of current are flowing in the circuit and then to the probe. Uh, the current flows from the probe through the human body to wherever the indifferent electrode is being placed which is usually a hand uh, through the variable resistor which can change the amount of current flowing in the circuit through the switch which can turn it on and off back to the positive side of our DC source. Let's examine the effect of lye on live tissue. Lye or sodium hydroxide is a strongly alkaline and caustic chemical. No wonder that lye is the active ingredient of household cleansers such as Drano. If this chemical can eat away the sludge in your drain pipes, you can imagine what it can do to sensitive live human tissue. Fortunately, in electrolysis, the lye can be produced in small measured amounts in follicular tissue, causing selective destruction of follicular parts without significant destruction of adjacent skin and subcutaneous tissue. The exact effect of lye on human tissue is to break up the complex tissue proteins that are vital for life. In breaking up these complex chemicals, which are normally like jelly in consistency, the tissue becomes liquefied, producing a soupy liquid composed of tissue fluids and denatured or decomposed proteins. This liquid, although not poisonous, is not compatible with life. Normally, after electrolysis, the body absorbs these non-living chemicals and recycles them, producing new live tissue where the follicle once was. The lye itself is neutralized by chemicals in the body called buffers. The body normally has no trouble dealing with the small amount of lye produced. To more fully understand how lye is produced in the human hair follicle, we need to look at the lye gradient concept. We chose a standard cylindrical non-insulated probe and we insert it into a salt solution similar to human tissue. We then pass direct current from the negative pole of our epilator through the probe into the solution. The result is the production of lye in the solution around the probe. Concentration of lye and also the greatest destructive potential will be in the solution closest to the probe. As you go farther and farther away from the probe, the concentration of lye becomes weaker and weaker until you get to a certain distance away where the lye is so weak that it has no damaging effect on the tissue. This is called the critical zone. A definition of this critical zone is as follows. The critical zone is the distance from a probe beyond which the lie is not strong enough to do any damage. 
simple example would be to put a teaspoon of lye crystals in 20 gallons of water. The resulting solution would be so weak it wouldn't even burn your eye if some splashed into it. If, however, you took one teaspoon of lye and put it into a cup of water, you would have a very strong caustic mixture that would quickly damage the tissue of your eye or uh, a hair follicle. Of course, if you are trying to destroy the bulb and dermal papilla of a hair follicle, you must be sure that all of these structures are within the critical zone and not outside it. If part of the dermal papilla lies outside the critical zone, this part will survive and the hair will regrow. In this diagram,